Good afternoon. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Alice Wong, Minister of State for Seniors, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Fernie. Minister Wong. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Lower Mainland. Now, I won't claim it to be my city because my city is where your plane lands. Don't blame me if you had a rough landing. <laughs> okay, so welcome. And uh, you know, when I mean the airport, it means Richmond. You know, the name is Vancouver Richmond, uh, Vancouver Airport. But the two mayors been fighting to see if we it can get the name changed. But I don't see a learning prospect in that. <laughs> So uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today because I've met so many familiar faces, oh, you know, wh whom I've met over the number of months I've been in this wonderful position. So I'm really very pleased to participate in this very important and timely conference. It is always an honor to be among so many experts in the field of aging. The Government of Canada values the important work the Canadian Association for Gerontology has done in this area. The Government of Canada also recognizes seniors and the valuable contributions they have made and continue to make in our communities, workplaces, and families. We all know that issues affecting seniors are complex and require a collaborative approach from all levels of governments. Seniors organizations, professional associations, academics, experts, and non-governmental organizations. Like many of you attending this conference, our government is committed to supporting the well-being of Canada's seniors and meeting their needs, their ongoing needs. Working together, we can all encourage seniors to stay active, engaged, and informed in a rapidly changing world. As Minister of State for Seniors, I'm naturally interested in learning more about how we can help people to age well so that they can live longer and healthier lives. To tell you a little secret, somebody asked me, you know, what would you like to teach after politics? I said, mm -mm, I'm not going to teach politics. I'm going to teach about aging. So I'm learning from you, so make sure that I don't steal anything from you. One thing I've learned through my travels across the country is that we're all going to need more help from technology. That's why I was glad to have had the opportunity last year to visit the Toronto Rehab Centre and to meet its Director of Research, Dr. Jeff Fernie. Dr. Fernie has a PhD in Bioengineering from the University of Strathclyde and is currently a professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. Throughout his career, Dr. Fernie has worked hard to find ways to use technology to help people with disabilities cope with the practical challenges of daily life. And he has a special interest in developing devices to help the elderly stay mobile and independent. Dr. Fernie and his team are doing wonderful work for older people. I have already witnessed that, and I'm eager to hear more from his presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fernie. Minister Wong, distinguished colleagues, what a pleasure it is to be here amongst so many friends and amongst so many new faces. That's um, a very healthy sign in an organization, especially in these times when conferences are more and more difficult to attend. It speaks highly of the organizers here. It speaks highly of the field, and it speaks highly of the need for all of your input into addressing these important challenges. We're indeed lucky that we have a federal minister who is so committed and so interested in actually doing the work and, uh, and not just the politics. What a pleasure it is to meet a minister who takes so much trouble to learn from our colleagues about the issues. Thank you, minister. So, 
Just a little background on Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, which is now part of the enormous university health network in, Lon in uh, Toronto, in London, in Toronto. <laughs> it's, um, oh, I get so absent-minded at times. I, <laughs> I can't remember my own name, let alone where I live. Um, it's a huge, huge organization. TRI is a small part of it, but actually I think it's going to control the whole organization quite shortly. Just don't tell them that. It's already become the largest rehabilitation research group in the world, which doesn't say a lot. In some ways, it's kind of neat. It's something we can be proud of. But it's also indicative that this area of medicine, this area of research, is really just beginning. Um, it's really just beginning to make it. And uh, uh, that, that, that's, that's where we're at. Now, in terms of focus... Uh, we have a very liberal interpretation of rehabilitation, which is presumably why I'm standing here, because one might think that rehabilitation was a very narrow part of aging. In fact, we focus in three areas. We focus on preventing people from ever needing rehabilitation, and this is terribly relevant to aging. Preventing any kind of accidents or injuries, falls or um, disabilities that result from, from those accidents and injuries, illness, infection, as you'll see. Obviously, the rehabilitation itself, because people, including me, um, occasionally end up with things going wrong to them, and you have to get fixed. And then, after you've been fixed, you have to get back into society. And then thirdly, whether you've ever touched the healthcare system or not, as we all grow older, we all know that we begin to accumulate a number of sometimes quite minor problems, but when they coalesce, it becomes a big problem for us, and we'd all like to continue living together with our families in our own homes. So these are the three foci for us. There are nine teams, so there's a lot more work than I can give um, time to today. I'm going to focus on some projects related to three teams, and particularly to the technology team, which is a team that I still am involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to give you some examples. I don't like talking in the abstract very much. I like to talk about concrete outcomes. One of the things I'm proudest about in our organization is that we don't just go for outputs. We don't just count the number of publications and the number of grants, but we emphasize the outcomes, the impact on people. We set about 100 goals a year across the organization, and we track them until they're achieved year after year. I'm going to give you examples of six um, practical solutions to big problems, practical solutions that either uh, we've, we've got ready now or in the very next few months. I'm going to begin with sleep apnea, which you might think is rather curious, um, because why would we be talking about sleep, sleep apnea in a, in a meeting such as this until we realize that 7% of adults have obstructive sleep apnea, but only 1 in 10 of those have ever been diagnosed. So 9 out of 10 people who have obstructive sleep apnea don't know they have it. They might suspect it, many of them, but they don't know they have it. The medical system doesn't know they have it. But as a result of having it and not treating it, they have three times the chance of having a cardiac event they have four times the chance of having a stroke, and they are the cause of major road accidents, major cause. So it's actually a huge public health issue. It's in many ways as big an issue as hypertension and diabetes, and it's unrecognized. So why is this? Well, the little acronym PSG, polysomnography, probably sums it up. In order to be diagnosed with sleep apnea, you have to go to a sleep clinic. You have to spend the night there. You have to have lots of wires and things all over you, and you have to try and sleep. <laughs> it's expensive to government. In my province, it costs us over $500 every time we do one, and my Minister of Health is very concerned about that because we do a lot of them, and despite the fact that I tell her that we're saving money in the long run by preventing all of these strokes and heart attacks and road accidents, it's still a big item on her budget. In British Columbia, I understand, you have to wait for two years to get into one of these sleep clinics. 
In the United States, it costs you or your insurer a lot of money. So what have we done? Well, again, technology can provide some really neat solutions. What we've done is we've developed this device, which is disposable. You can wear it at home, and it works as well as a sleep clinic for diagnosis. So you can pick it up at the store, take it home, and find out if you have it. Not only that, you can afford to do it many nights on the run because there is a variability in about 25% of the population in terms of their performance night after night. What it is um, is a piece of nicely divine plastic and some tight little circuitry, but that is what we do. We translate ideas into concrete, in this case plastic, things. Because it's my view that an idea, actually I'm going to get things thrown at me in a minute, but an idea is worth about 10 cents. So collectively, each table in this room, we can probably come up with a dozen ideas in about 10 minutes, and we'll have each earned about $1.20 in my eyes. What I mean, collectively we'll have earned it around the table. We have to divide it amongst us. What I mean by that is until an idea is translated into a treatment that you can test or a building code or a policy change that you can implement and evaluate or a device that you can swallow or ride on or wear or something and test in some way it has little value. So the emphasis of our program is taking ideas and moving them to tangible things quickly. That was sleep apnea. Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene. What's that got to do with this? Well, hospital-acquired infections have irritated me for a long time. How pathetic and how, how devastating to go into hospital to have a treatment and to come out worse than you went in. People are frightened to go to hospital. 10% of people who are admitted to hospital catch something that they didn't have before they went in. 100,000 deaths each year in North America. 100,000 deaths each year in North America. Well, they're not all because of poor hand hygiene, but it's thought of maybe as many as half are, roughly. Don't take that as gospel. It's a pretty rough estimate. And not all hand hygiene is solvable. It's not, all, it's not that easy a problem to solve. But it sure as heck needs to be better than this. So what can we do? Well, this is a graph of the hand hygiene performance as assessed by audits in the province of Ontario. Because under legislation in Ontario, each institution has to report its hand hygiene performance every year. And it's quite interesting. Um, it's quite interesting. On the vertical axis is whether people wash their hands after seeing a patient. And on the horizontal axis is whether people wash their hands before seeing a patient. So the, you really want to be in the top right-hand corner. That means you've done everything right. But there's a thumb that are way down the bottom. So what do you think is going on here? Are the ones at the top fiddling the chart? Or the ones at the bottom negligent? Or are the ones at the bottom honest? What is the, what is the reason for this spread from below 40% to 100%. In fact, there are some institutions who have hired statisticians to work out arguments so they can report higher than 100%. <laughs> and they still have infections. So the healthcare system can be driven by numbers, but whether it's real quality is another question. So one of the things we did there was some of our graduate students got together and put together a tool which is now used in 100 hospitals, more than 100 hospitals around the world, and in two-thirds of the academic hospitals in Ontario to standardize this measurement. It doesn't remove all the bias, but it makes it a little bit more accurate, a bit more consistent, and it allows us to compare performance in Canada with other jurisdictions that apply different rules automatically. But I think more important than that is this. This badge, which doesn't have a cover on it, because I want you to see it's actually quite simple inside, I think um, we're very proud of. This is a badge that you wear. You will eventually wear it um, instead, probably, of your ID badge. It'll probably have your ID badge sort of stuck to the front of it. It'll probably get a little smaller. But where that pink arrow is pointing is an eye. And the eye is looking at the ceiling. And... Here's one of our 
um, chronic co continuous care units, they're called these days, complex continuing care. It's a chronic, what used to be a chronic disease ward of 50 beds. And you'll notice over the entrance, I'll just highlight it there, there's an array of LEDs, infrared. They're sending a pulsed infrared signal down, downwards like a curtain. And when you walk under that with the badge, it knows you've walked into that room. It knows the precise time you've walked into that room. And if you haven't washed your hands, as Veronique will tell you here, who's been running this program for some time, it will discreetly vibrate. <laughs> discreetly. It does not shout. It does not sound alarms. It does not embarrass you. It discreetly vibrates. The reason for that is that this problem is not because of idleness. It's generally much more difficult to solve than you think. If you're a busy nurse or busy clinical care provider, you may have to cleanse your hands, say, 100, 120 times in a shift, in an eight-hour shift, if you're doing your job perfectly. Assume you take 30 seconds each time because you're able to use alcohol gel and maybe rub as you walk along. That's one hour of an eight-hour shift in order to be perfect in hand hygiene, rubbing alcohol gel onto your hands. It is not trivial. There are a lot of people screaming and yelling for your help. You forget, even when I'm demoing the system, I almost always forget to use it to wash my hands as I walk out of the room. It's very difficult. And there are complications. You've walked into a room and someone's made a mess of their bed. They've had a poop on the bed. So you clean it up and you walk out with the sheets. Do you put them on the floor, or wash your hands and pick them up again? There's, it's a very complicated issue. But we can do much better and technology can help us because in this case, if you use the squirter on the wall to wash your hands, it also emits a little infrared signal and it tells your device that you've washed them and your device glows green. Your device maintains all of the statistics so that as, a, as an organization, you can work on how to optimize performance as well. And as a patient, you can see that your caregiver's glowing green. <laughs> and you can say, doctor, 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 your badge isn't glowing green. <laughs> and he can say, oh, darn it, these bloody things never work. <laughs> and he can walk out and wash his hands and come back glowing green. So, another example, falls. We've all talked about the problem of falls. We've talked about the problem of falls until we're blue in the face. We've, we know what a tragedy it is when someone who's aging falls over and breaks their hip. You know... I hate to do this again, but I'm going to do it to this audience. Raise your hands if you know someone who's reasonably close to your family, close to your family as an older person who fell over and broke their hip. Raise your hands and hold them high and look around the room. Now, I want you to put your hands down and I want to raise your hand if that person got back to anything like their original independent mobility. Look around the room. Okay, this is a big deal. Is Nancy Edwards in the room? Nancy has made the point that despite all of the research we've been doing on aging and on falls, we don't seem to have decreased them. I don't want anyone to get upset in this room because there are some particular programs that have shown success. But generally we haven't. We have not seen the same success as we've seen with tobacco reduction or with car, car deaths or any number of others. We've not seen the same success. People are still falling over, breaking their hips and dying and certainly losing their mobility. So what are we going to do? Because we don't have very many research dollars spare. We need to decide on where we're going to focus. Now, this week in the news, um, our friends in Steve Rabinovich and our friends in Vancouver uh, reported on a study, a brilliant study they've done, where they've collected lots of videotape, uh, well, not videotape these days, but video records of real falls. And they came to the same conclusion, but with much greater validity than we did. We did this in the late 1980s, 
we got just 25, I think, falls, and I'm just showing you a couple of them. But we, we came to the same conclusion. I'll show this one again. This lady is walking along. She doesn't slip. She doesn't trip. She's not knocked. She suddenly loses the ability to keep her center of gravity within her base of support and falls over. Watch the gentleman in the top right here. He's not, not knocked or anything. He suddenly falls to the floor. So this was, this was a very important observation from the Vancouver crowd because what it means is that this is a very difficult problem to solve. For these large group of people, we've got to change their physiology. We've got to change their behavior. That's tough to do. On the other hand, unfortunately, the minority, as in this particular case, this lady who's knocked by the swinging door and who broke her hip and died as a consequence, yeah, you can stop the door swinging, right? So where do we have to focus? We have to focus on the things that we can fix now. And I think we have to do that urgently. So a lot of falls are happening on stairs. It's a scandal, actually, how many falls are happening on stairs. Falls are still happening on the level. And our emergency rooms are full every time we get an icy day in the winter with people slipping up. These are areas where we can actually create solutions. We can actually make an impact. Stair falls. Anthea Tinker in the United Kingdom went around to people's homes, and she had her graduate students go to people, seniors' homes, and she said, tell me, what is your biggest worry? And their biggest worry was not their financial circumstances and was not their health. It was their stairs. They're worried stiff about their stairs. They're thinking of moving to a bungalow in Britain. In Toronto, they're thinking of moving into a condominium. They're thinking of moving somewhere where there aren't stairs. And at that age, it's a big thing to move, as you know better than any other group in, in, uh, anywhere. It's a big thing. And it's a big expense. It's a big social disruption. But you cannot. They're frightened of their stairs. 5% of known fall deaths occur on stairs. Actually, that should have been 25%. The, five, the twos disappeared. 25% of known fall deaths occur on stairs. And 70% of those are in the home. So this is a big issue. Deaths from stair falls, Jake Pauls tells us, are increasing by 6% per year in the U.S. There's some indication that they're increasing at a faster rate here in Canada. In fact, stair falls in Canada are costing us, if you count not only the health but the social costs, about a million dollars an hour. Very little research has happened in the world on this topic, but... Some good research has happened out of the UK, particularly by a fellow called Royce. And I don't, you don't need to see the detail of these graphs. What I want you to see is he went and he went to over a thousand people's uh, homes with questionnaires to ask them about their stairs, and they had to make measurements of their stairs. And that swarm of bees on the left is the height of the rises of the stairs versus the length of the run, the depth of the step. So you see there was a big scatter. Stairs come in all sorts of designs. The graph on the right shows the accidents that had occur, occurred on those stairs as a function of the depth of the step. And below you see there was a reduction from six times, a six-fold reduction as you increase the depth of the step. If the, steep, if the stairs are steep, if there's very little place to land your foot, your foot oversteps. It slips off and you die. You get in trouble. You break your hip and whatever. We're having a hell of a game persuading this, getting this message across to change the Canada Building Code at the moment. And we're, so we're working very, very hard on that. And in order to, to change the code, this is somewhere where we need to focus our research because... You have to have a lot of evidence to make a change like this. Because every little bit you add to the size of a house gives you billions of dollars of expenditure. 
right? But these falls are costing us billions of dollars. So being able to balance how much you can afford to extend the, the, the depth of the step is an important issue on the basis of evidence. So we're doing some work on that. Here's some very simple experiments where um, we have three staircases where they have different riser heights and in each case you can sort of slide these boxes over each other to create a full range of stair de step depth. And we can do the biomechanics on that. And the biomechanics is, allows you to produce the numerical evidence that I think will make the difference in persuading the builders and others that we need to improve our standards. You see, what, what was done here in Vancouver this week um, by the team here in showing that essentially it's the environment you've got to focus on is really important. And they're doing some very important work with new flooring. I mean, I can't talk about it. They talk about it. But imagine if you could have flooring that actually when you fall on it makes it impossible to break your hip. A really, really practical solution. Very, very important to, 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 to support those kinds of initiatives. Independent mobility. Independent mobility is the core to independence, of course. So what are we doing in an affordable way there? This is a scene from one of our simulations. This is our, our sort of simulated uh, living apartment where we test out some of these ideas. And um, you may all be familiar with those poles which I've been an advocate of for many years. In fact, my team brought the first one to commercial success a long time ago although the pole was actually invented in, in Sask Saskatchewan, but it, we made it commercially available. And it's the core. My house is full of them because of my wife's problems and things, and I've benefited from them. I changed my hip, my right hip, I changed this summer. And it works. And I was telling people, it didn't work very well until a couple of weeks ago, until I discovered this, that the manual didn't tell me about the button that you press. And when you want to go backwards, you press the button there and it works. It goes backwards and you press it again and it goes forwards. So it works magnificently. And I actually, I have to admit, didn't need any rehabilitation. But I did use these poles to hang on to and get up and around. And my house is full of them and the cottage is full of them as well. But I always want to do something a little bit better than that. And I always wanted to be able to have a full Lego kit throughout the house. <laughs> so that... When dad comes home, when dad comes home, and he's, we've, we didn't have much notice, you know, he's, he, he's coming home tomorrow, and mum's really worried, and how's she going to get him around the house? And she doesn't have a lot of money, and she doesn't, she, she's a rented house, or getting contractors in is unrealistic. Imagine if you could get something that you could buy in a four-foot box, and you could just clip together and it would wedge from the floor to the ceiling and you could snap things together like a Lego kit and have handrails going from the bed to the toilet, for example. And then, after you've finished with them, return them to the store that you did the rent-to-buy kind of program from. So that's sort of what we're doing. This is, this is actually not the design we've settled on. The design we've settled on will be on the market in January, we're told. But it's a similar sort of approach where everything clicks together like gigantic Lego and you can dismantle it and put it together. And can have joints and all sorts of things. So on the left there is actually, I didn't realize until I looked at this slide, it's actually a scene from my cottage, and the assumption was getting it ready for me, using the bedroom on the bottom there to get to the bathroom. And if I could afford to have five poles, and these poles joined together in this way, then that would solve my problem. That was great. But I couldn't, the other people couldn't get past the poles. So the actual, the system actually has a sort of gate system. And I can't show you much detail for, for pattern rules at the moment. But as you go through, you can unclip any of these rails and pass through and clip them up again. Now, there has to be science. It's not just creativity. So where should these poles be? What are the forces applied? All of those things are, uh, are worked out through science. And and so that we can actually advise people how far they should be away from the seat or the bed and what the height of the rail should be, 
things so that we get best use out of them. That, that's Dan, one of my graduate students, doing that work at the moment. You know, unfortunately, we have to spend some time in hospital. And that's a drag. As we get older, you can't totally avoid it. You can't always just talk about home care. Things do happen. But there's a rather sad consequence of going to hospital if you're a senior. The sad consequence is you generally come out worse off than when you went in. Significantly worse in many ways sometimes. You've certainly lost independent mobility. You've probably developed contractures. You've probably developed some sores. You've probably lost your balance, you've lost the strength, you've decompensated, you can't get out of bed. It's a real problem. We really need to focus on helping seniors get out of bed when they go into an institution, and keeping them active. Nurses and other healthcare workers in acute care are becoming very aware of this and very concerned about it. So one of the things that's difficult to do is to get out of bed easy. And those pole things won't work. Because if you wedge them in a hospital between the floor and the ceiling, the ceiling goes up. It's just, <laughs> it's just hanging there, right? So what we've got here is Stand Easy, which is coming on the market also in January, and you're seeing almost the final thing. Some parts you're seeing are final, where you can put this firmly on either side of the bed whenever you want it, at any position you want. And if you don't want it, you don't have to have it, because it is clicked to a rail on the, on the wall instead of the ceiling. So you install these rails around the wall and then either the housekeeping or the maintenance or maybe even OT, they're practical people, um, or nursing, can come and can clip it wherever they need it and you get a steady, firm way of getting in and out. A low-cost, simple solution. Not the total solution, but at least one that makes it possible to get people out, as long as you encourage them to do it and teach them to do it. You know, we have this thing called the Challenging Environment Assessment Laboratory. And I had the fun of taking Minister Wong down there to see it recently. And our objective down there is to create highly controllable and safe conditions where we can go through realistic scenarios and we can deal with typically challenging situations because we're all faced with challenges. Stairs are a challenge if you haven't got much mobility. Getting out of bed is a challenge. But for a lot of seniors, winter is a hell of a challenge. I mean, in Canada, a large part of our population lives in cities, lives in environments where there is snow on the ground for more than 150 days a year. This is not trivial. Many seniors are stuck in their houses for months at a time, frightened to go out, having too much difficulty to go out, in somewhat darkness, because it's darker in winter, socially isolated. I mean, it's a really, really big problem. So how do we deal with this? Well, yes, we can have social programs to support them. We can try and change their behavior and stuff. But I really think... If we want a quick bang for a buck, we deal with some of the environmental issues where we know we can make a difference. Winter is fun, if you like it. This is Bonnie and I and our dog Sooty going for a walk at the cottage. And if you go well dressed up and you wear the right kind of footwear, you can do well. Footwear. We now have a laboratory where we can test footwear to measure... Um, how well it will perform on different surfaces. The laboratory we have here is according to the international standards, the Sartre tests. And we're using this to characterize footwear, and then we're characterizing it in the real situations to see how good the international standards are and how we have to improve them on them. On them. And there's quite a lot of work to do, both in, in, in the measurement and in the interpretation of the measurement, as I'll show you in a minute. This machine, for your interest loads a foot. You can see a, a shoe in there at an angle. It's going to hit the ground at an angle like your, your ankle striking the ground and then the ground will be moved to see what friction there was. 
The ground in this case looked white because it was deliberately ice and frosty because we're testing the effects of ice and snow. The international standard uses oil on stainless steel, which is rather different. Now, watch this. This is why we need to do it. I won't mention the name of this company. We work with a number of companies, and it's not the big one that we're known for working with, which is Markswick Warehouse. But this company sent its line of shoes, winter shoes, for us to test. This is the pick of the crop. This is the top of the line shoe for going to the North Pole. It's designed specifically for ice. Very expensive shoe. So, you know, you might be persuaded if you went into the store and you saw that this was a winter shoe with a, a name, I can't tell you the name, but it's evocative of real adhesion to ice and of being suitable for going to amazing temperatures. I mean, some of these shoes and boots are advertised as being suitable down to temperatures. I think I'm going to exaggerate, but not far off of minus 180 degrees. We've never seen anything lower than 60-something in Canada. But, so you, I don't think you should go out at minus 180 degrees, by the way. I think it's yeah. not a good thing to do. I think your leg will just snap off. But anyway, um, the... You would look at the footwear and you would say, hey, this is really neat. It's got an aggressive tread. It's got bright colors. It's labeled this evocative name. And you would think, I better buy that. And as a consumer, you would then go and fall over, presumably, having spent a lot of money. So it's not even just a question of developing better footwear, which I'm proud to say we're doing with, with, with uh, I'll give them a plug even, because they're progressive, Markswork Warehouse. We're doing it with them and we're doing it with others. Um, because developing better footwear is important and testing better footwear is important, but giving the information to consumers is important. So we need a better way of labeling. So when you go and buy footwear, you can know what to expect. So we're trying to, to develop that, and we do that in these, in these special environments. The little question, this is just a little insert, because we just finished some studies of, of, of crutch tips. Um, without a tip on a crutch, right? Now, there are also hazards with crutch tips, so we've got a long way to go, but you'll see in a moment that at least walking on ice and plain concrete, and actually on plain concrete as well, they're quite, they can be quite effective. Um, here you are taking rather more confident stride, and it doesn't slip, see? Here we're, looking, we're beginning to look at scooters. Do you know that more and more seniors are using scooters? Scooters are outselling wheelchairs now. They're outselling them because they look more normal. Um, they look like buggies, and they're sexy-looking, colorful things, and people like them. I'm going to have a scooter. Why not? I think they're neat. However, if you read the manuals on all the scooters, they say don't go out in the rain. <laughs> and they say don't use them in adverse conditions like cold weather. <laughs> so, of course, people have to ignore the instructions. But it's a pretty sad thing if you've got to hold down a job or you want to go shopping and it's cold <laughs> for 150 days or something, your bread gets a bit stale. <laughs> so we're looking at how scooters perform in poor conditions, ice and snow. And here this is just a, a, a little quick test being done outside the main pods to, see, to check that this scooter isn't going to fall over before it slides when it's inside the pod. And we're doing more and more work there. We want to develop a consumer guide, if anyone's interested in help sponsoring it, a consumer guide for the purchase of scooters. This is our winter chamber, the full winter chamber. And it, like all the other payloads that we have, can be put onto that motion base that you just saw. And then the, you can do experiments inside. I'll come back to the motion base at the moment. But here, we're, we're actually doing the pink stuff is ice. We're pumping pink glycol through. 
we can control the temperature of the ice precisely from wet, very slippery ice to quite sticky, very cold ice. In this particular case, we've raised a little platform with some ice on because we want to measure the forces underneath the foot in order to work out the effective coefficient of friction. Because those of you who are into the physics and mechanics of this, you'll realize that the coefficient of friction at the moment that matters, the coefficient of friction is measured when the foot just starts to slip. And it's the force that it generates opposing the direction of that slip for the amount of vertical force. So that tells you what capacity the footwear has for resisting slips. We now... I, that thing that looks like the rings of Saturn is just to show you that we actually make snow and we make very nice snow, very fluffy snow and we can make it into rutted snow and slushy snow and all sorts of things and fill that large cabinet up and then shovel it into the, ch into the chamber and then, so I'm gonna start then, we can, um, com then we can combine it on the motion platform and create a windy snowy hill for example. So we have some pretty neat tools to really get real answers in short time, really affordable, meaningful answers. Things like labels for footwear that you can buy in an ordinary store. Well, distracted walking and driving. This is not just a problem for seniors. <laughs> Increasingly, kids are walking around, and it's become quite a big issue. The insurance companies have got in touch with us. They're walking around answering their cell phones, right? Actually, I have to tell you, I walked into a lamppost for the, for the BlackBerry, and they interviewed me on a TV program the other day, and, and I demonstrated a misguided piece of software. You can actually, it's loaded on one of my Apple phones here. You can actually download a program which which I call I walk or something, but anyway, it allows you, as you're typing in, the camera at the front is projecting the image on the screen. Of course, it, doesn't, it fails to comprehend the whole issue of vision and that vision is not just a question of, of it being there and seeing in terms of photons. It's a question of perception and processing the visual image. But nevertheless, you can buy that software and kid yourself that as you type into your machine, you're seeing the scene in front of you. It's becoming a big problem. It's becoming a big problem for driving. If you see advertisements for cars nowadays, um, they're sold on the basis that you talk to them and they'll understand you. Well, actually, if your speech is a little dyslexic, they won't, or if it's Glaswegian, they won't, or if it's very rural, they won't. If it's Quebecois, I'm not sure they will. It's a... It's, it's, and, and, and is really paying attention to it talking to you about the soccer score at the moment, the right thing to be doing when you're trying to make a left-hand turn? So we have some real problems with the design of vehicles. And I'm worried for the auto sector because what's going to happen, and the message that I'm trying to give them is get on side because what's going to happen is in a few years there's going to be an expose in the press about a large number of accidents and there's going to be a clamor from the public, and legislators, bless them, are going to have to do something very unfortunate, and, and that's they're going to have to ban a lot of this technology in the same way as they banned hands-free phones. Now, hands, banning hands-free phones was not sensible because it really didn't address the issue. It isn't a question of whether you have to hold your phone in your hand. It's a question of where you're putting your attention. So there's going to, there'll be a ban on things which might be helpful. Like the phone. Isn't that the irony? Alice is like, I mean, Minister, <laughs> Minister Wong's phone is ringing. Fortunately, fortunately, she's sitting down and she's not going to fall over. <laughs> but these are very serious issues. So we have one environment which is called Street Lab and you can go inside that and there's a three-dimensional model of Toronto in there and you can see the pedestrians and the traffic and, and what's really unusual 
is that as you walk through this environment, which surrounds you 270 degrees, it's more than it looks in this picture because you're looking behind a corner. As you walk through that environment, as Kathy Petura Fuller over there is doing, Kathy's made sure that it has excellent soundscape as well so that we're actually able to look at the interaction between visual and sound stimuli and how we process these two simultaneously. And then I think work that she's doing that's so very, very important is what is the effects of improving hearing on balance, for example, and on distraction? If we had hearing aids that would focus on the person that you're looking at, would that improve safety or diminish it? Very important issues. Why is it that kids wearing hearing aids fall over more often than kids who don't need them? What's going on there? We get very realistic scenes and, um, and uh, we cover every religion. It's, there's no discrimination. You can, you can go to your church of choice in that environment. And it's quite realistic, and you can vary weathers and things. It'll get more realistic. At the moment, all of our females are young, very attractive ladies who, if you walk, I've taken them out of the scene because I get distracted and I forget what I'm talking to you about. <laughs> but it's not quite a typical population yet, but we'll get there. One of my graduate students always wanted an Audi. So he's built one here. Um, it's... It's a very crude mock-up of an Audi because we're actually building um, the most advanced driving simulation anywhere in the world. We, we love simulations, not for their own sake, but they allow us to get from the laboratory to the real world fast. We don't have to wait for a winter day of a particular condition. We can create it, and we can reproduce it, and we've got a safety harness so no one gets hurt. We don't have to wait and put, take someone out into the middle of a street and see if they get run over. We can do it in a controlled way. With you can pick the person. <laughs> but there's a dirty little secret about simulators. And that is that if you go to a simulator facility... In many of them, you have a better than 70% chance of being ill. Um, and it's not because you're weak. Astronauts and fighter pilots become sick in many simulators. Interestingly, they get very angry. And they get angry because they know what it does feel like in the real circumstance. And their, their senses are tuned very finely. And they seem to detect mistakes more than others. And those conflicts lead to sickness. So one of the reasons that we're building this particular little mock-up car is to address this in street lab as a temporary measure. Because when you, when you sit in a simulator, most of them, when you go round a corner, you don't move at all. The scenery moves by you. That's very upsetting. Um, it also gets a bit blurry as it goes by, but it's upsetting because your, 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 your balance organs, your vection organs are not detecting anything. It's, it's really strange. So in our system, you will be on a turntable and you will rotate and the scenery stays stationary. So what contribution will that make to the reduction of sickness? What contribution will other things, like a rumble of the road and things, make to the reduction of its sickness? In general, they tell me that very, very poor simulators don't produce sickness because you don't really believe it. As the simulator gets a little bit better, you get lots of sickness. And then as it gets perhaps really good, then presumably you will eventually be as sick as you are in a car. Right? So... So this is what it's going to look like, roughly. Um, it has to be realistic. And so one of the things that's realistic for an older person is that when you go for a drive, you don't just see a clean image. You don't even see a video with rain in the image. You see a mess on your windshield that's difficult to look through. You see glare that can be very, very bright at times. 
even in the daytime. So we have fun. We are creating rainstorms at the moment with different patterns of rain. And I just thought you could see, share some of this fun um, because sometimes it's a very messy rain and so we need to simulate it in various ways. This is low-fat chocolate milk. Here's tea for muddy rain. Now, it's not projected. I mean, it, ca it comes from other directions, but we're just looking at the effects of... and, and oil on, um, on windshields. So, look, you know, there are many issues to do with driving that I, I must be serious for a moment. The license to drive is probably a more important factor for the independence of a senior than anything else. If you cannot drive to the corner store, never mind the doctor's office, that's probably a bad thing to do, but to the corner store it's certainly a good thing to go to. If you can't get to the corner store you can't, and you can't walk there, you're stuck. You need your car more than ever. So when someone takes away your driving license, it's a devastating time, absolutely devastating. What we want to do is to help people drive for as long as possible, but not to have stories in the newspaper about them killing younger people or even killing themselves. So how are we going to do that? Because the tests that doctors do in their offices have no known correlation to accidents. And on-road driving, ah. and on-road driving tests also are not very realistic. I made a proposal to the Ministry of Health in Ontario that we would rent Toyota pickup trucks after the Taliban had finished with them. <laughs> we would fill them with tire debris, and we would drive in convoy down the 401 with people with dementia and other difficulties following us and we would throw the tire debris over and see how they did. <laughs> to be quite serious, our, challenging, our road tests are not very challenging. They're not done in the dark, in snow. They're not avoiding real accidents. What we need to do is to be able to develop valid testing regimes that people feel comfortable and have some confidence in. They're not sick, they get in and they can work out for themselves what their limitations are and we can perhaps use this to support provincial and national programs for customized driving licensing. So people can continue. They don't have their licenses taken away at random but provided they agree that they're only going to drive in daylight, for example. And by the way, our simulator doesn't just have a picture of a white headlight. That's not glare. As you drive through this 360 stereoscopic environment, headlights will come on a robot arm at you. Um, the sun really shines at you. The weather is cold. You have to wear a, a coat and rely on the heat in the car. Very different kind of simulation. But, but if you agree you'll only drive in daylight, or if you agree to stay off the 400 series of roads, or if you agree perhaps in an extreme that an, another driver has to be sitting next to you when you drive, just as when you're a kid, then that's okay. That's better than nothing. And we want to move in that direction, again, to a practical, easy, quick solution. My time is not quite up, but it's almost. Four minutes. Someone's checking his watch down there. My last point, quickly, caregiver stress. Caregiver stress takes us a number of forms. I don't need to lecture to you about that. Caregivers are our biggest labor force in the healthcare system now. I mean, family are our biggest labor force in the healthcare system now. By far the biggest labor force. And they have a rough time. They have a rough time. They have a rough time from a physical point of view and they have a rough time from a psychological point of view. The daughters who are looking after the parents at home and who've had to give up their social lives, give up their career aspirations, give up their financial circumstances to support people in very difficult circumstances, my heart goes out to them. It is a very big issue. In our province... Staney Brown told me in this documentation to, to show that over a quarter of families were providing care 
over the last two years, continuous care to someone over the last two years. It's a very big issue. We're as worried about caregivers as we are about the individuals themselves. I'm privileged to have Alex Mihalidis in the audience here. Alex leads the AI and robotics team. Alex has a brilliant concept. He calls it the intelligent brick. So let's give him the intelligent brick. And one of the many things that he's developed is a system that detects when someone's fallen over. And it asks them, are you okay? And it has a discussion with them, and it brings people, helpers in on their cell phones or whatever, and gets the help that's needed. So you say, well, these systems already exist. You can buy these badges. Yeah, but in 70% of the case, people aren't wearing the badge when they need it. And in a significant proportion of the people who are wearing it, um, they're incapacitated and can't use it, or for some strange reason, choose not to use it. This system you don't have to have anything on. In fact, you can be naked um, with this system. Because this system won't broadcast your picture anywhere. It simply talks to you. It recognizes that you've fallen over. And it, uh, it, with your permission, will get you help. A low-cost system, in fact, in fact, you don't even need a service provider. It might be better to have a service provider in case no one answers of the list that you want. But you don't have to. You can just connect to the family. He's actually developed a whole range of products to help with this social problem of caregivers having to monitor all the time. Products that measure blood pressure, blood products that watch that people are eating and drinking at the right time. Absolutely brilliant program, and one that we need to put a lot of effort behind. But finally, in my last minute, my advice to any woman, any woman, any man, because there are caregivers who are men as well, but I, I, I always get accused of being sexist here. I'm not meaning to be. I mean, you're just facing the reality that most caregivers are women. But, it, but any caregiver, if you want a safe job, go into mining. <laughs> it has a third of the occupational injury rate of working in a nursing home. And Tilak Dutta, one of my graduate students, has demonstrated why. Despite all of the mechanized lifts that we have for lifting and moving people, you've still got to get something under them to lift them and move them. Minister Wong knows what's coming because I've injected this under her. And she enjoyed it, she assures me. You will watch this here. Here you see a little video of it. What we do, and this is coming on the market in March of next year. It's gone through all of its testing. It's just some last cosmetics that are being done. But you can just, you can just squirt the sling under someone with no effort whatsoever. doesn't matter how heavy they are. It carries the strap under. There is no friction. It unfolds as it goes. It crawls under, carrying the strap up the middle. And you'll see in a minute when you've finished with it, you just take hold of one end and pull it, and it comes with no effort because it turns itself inside out, creating no friction at all. So you just inject a few of these under. That's actually Tilak lying down there and Susan doing the injection. And you may think this is a bit painstaking, but it's better than breaking your back. And you, can, you don't have to have someone else. You can do it on your own. And, it, and you can take your time. It doesn't matter. Because what you can do is you, you wouldn't lift someone very far with... Um, you wouldn't lift someone very far just on straps. They'd fall through the middle, probably. But you can at least lift them a couple of inches up. And then once you've lifted them a couple of inches up, if they've made a mess of the bed, you can change the bedding quick, whip it out quick, put new bedding in, use a bedpan or whatever else quickly. Um, uh, very practical. Move them back up to the head of the bed. If you want, if you want to um, lift them off the bed, then you slip a sling under and lift them on the sling, knowing that you can remove the strap just that easily afterwards. So I think you've got the message there. And there's the fact that Rosalie's here. She's cheering a session this afternoon. You recognize yourself. She will tell you that she didn't realize that I'd put Tilak on top of Colin 
and Rosalie was standing there and, 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 and was rather surprised when I picked her up and put her on top so that she became the third person. And there's no problem in injecting under those three people and lifting. So again, the problem of lifting and moving people, it doesn't have to be an expensive solution, and we can perhaps may solve many of these caregiver problems. So in summary, I've given you examples of six solutions that are just sort of on their way out right now to big problems of sleep apnea, hand hygiene, falls on stairs, on the level on ice, independent mobility, distracted walking and driving, caregiver strength, mental and physical. This is the team, my team, the technology team in a more informal environment <laughs> doing this work. Thank you. Andrew, oh dear, this is going to be a difficult question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, one of the questions that I have is that your work is very oriented towards knowledge mobilization, putting this stuff into practice. Uh, and I, I work in a similar area to you, as you know. Uh, and one of the big issues is putting what we already know into practice, because there's been so much work in the area of assistive technology, for example. And one of the things that you did mention, for example, just simple things like the stairs and, the, and getting people in the design and the building industry to adopt new practices is really, really difficult. One of the interesting things is that if you look at things like building codes, you will find that a lot of those building codes are based on no evidence whatsoever. Yes, that's right. And yet the research, uh, you know, we're expected to provide research which definitively shows that some people have an impact. So there's a kind of an imbalance there. But to me, the, the real problem in this whole area is, is really shifting what we know in terms from our research and product design, etc., into the into the real world. And there's a lot of barriers that uh, that that we have to encounter in that. Andrew, um, we could talk about this for a long time. You're absolutely right. Um, I want to take the opportunity to um, compliment. Minister Wong, and earlier today you'll, you'll have met with Réjean Hibert. Réjean, I worked with him for many years as, as head of, when he was chair of the Institute on Aging with CIHR. He's now Minister of Health in the province of Quebec, a very evidence-oriented guy. Our minister is very evidence-based in health in Ontario. In fact, on, every time you want to make a policy recommendation in the Ontario government, you have to fill in a form which details the evidence in support of it. You must do that as a staffer. So things are changing. The building code thing has been a problem for me because it's, it's a long struggle, but I think we'll win that one. Um, uh, but you have to find all of these different vehicles. You have to find things like building codes and design guidelines to, to, to edge it forwards. It's, it's, it's a, a long process. Um, we've launched three companies in the last 18 months. I'm pleased to tell you that all three companies are doing exceptionally well. So that's another opportunity, although it's difficult to get the investment. Um, I just got turned down on a notice of intent for a, a grant. I thought it was the best grant I'd ever written. I got turned down for two reasons. One was that I didn't include a sex and gender analysis in sufficient detail. And the other was that I didn't detail the KT. KT itself is becoming an obstacle because KT itself has become a sort of academic field. And if you don't have the right words, I think we do KT. We do KT more effectively than any others, knowledge translation. We do KT more effectively than others because we actually get stuff out that people use. But that isn't what KT means. It's using the right words. So we've got a lot to do, and we've got a lot to do amongst ourselves, not just outside, because... Probably you were the peer reviewers who turned me down because I didn't have <laughs> enough KT. Um, I um, lived in a senior's home and I know of a man who started going downhill when his um, license to drive was uh, not renewed, and so it would be good, since yesterday the word engaged was used by the speaker, 
And uh, I think the, if there is one main goal that this conference should accomplish is to engage people who are not here, who are not as knowledgeable, but it's the educating, it's the spreading out of that to smaller groups of people. Because not everybody would want to spend three days in a conference like this. I had to take the bus, I had to get wet. But I would want to get involved. <laughs> and so how to go about that, to, to trickle it down to the people who will really be receiving that benefit will probably be uh, a challenge to you guys who are doing all the good work. Thank you. Yes, it is an important... It's, Inform I mean, information, the minister and I were talking before this about her mission to make information more available to seniors because there are, in fact, programs that many people don't apply to, she tells me. And, and certainly, you know, getting the information out is important, but we need to get the right information out. So, so thank you ever so much for your hospitality. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, Dr. Fernie. I think his talk epitomizes the kind of cutting-edge research that's going to take us into this next period of time. Uh, thank you once again.